Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Asma Shindi, Petroleum Engineer graduated from American University of Ras al Khaimah. On behalf of BioPetro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome all of you to our internship Natural Gas Engineering. Today's session will be about economic analysis, presented by a very expert speaker, Engineer Hosbeliani. Before I present our speaker, I would like to remind you, if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and keep the chat box professional. Now, our speaker is Dr. Is Engineer Hosbeliadi. He is a senior data scientist engineer at Marine Oil and Gas. Additionally, he is the, found, uh, the founder and CEO of, of, of Observ Intelligence LLC, focused on providing artificial intelligence, in-house training, and solutions. Mr. Biliadi has served as an, as an adjunct faculty member at multiple university, including West Virginia University, Marita College, and San Francis University. There, he taught data analytics, natural gas engineering, enhanced oil recovery, and hydraulic fracture, fracture stimulation design. Mr. Biliadi has over 10 years of experience working in various conventional and unconventional reservoirs across the world. He has worked on various machine learning projects and held short courses across various universities, organizations, and the Department of Energy. Mr. Biliadi is the primary author of Hydraulic Fracturing in Unconventional Reservoirs, first and second editions, and, um, and is the author of Machine Learning Guide for Oil and Gas Using Python. Hoss earned his bachelor and master's both in petroleum and natural gas engineering from West Virginia University. So please pay attention and welcome Engineer Hoss Biliadi. Engineer Hoss, the mic is yours. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so yeah, well, uh, it is um, morning in Texas. Uh, I'm sure it is probably later in the evening um, in Egypt and other countries. Um, so thanks for tuning in today. Um, so today is actually a very special topic. Economic analysis is one of the areas like when, when I taught any course, you know, at university level or any of the short courses, one of my favorite, you know, sections, you know, has been economic analysis. Uh, so when uh, Dr. Aguirre, he like asked me to present and I was like, okay, I can talk about economic analysis is one of the things that I actually enjoy talking about. So, so with that being said, let's get started and go over some of the um, um, concepts, you know, in, in, in economic analysis and capital budgeting. So first I want to get right into it. Let's talk about, uh, net present value. So what is net present value and wh what does it really intuitively mean? You know, uh, people talk about net present value all the time. The net present value of this project is this net present uh, value of this project is that, but what does it actually intuitively mean? So I want to really dive into a little more, more detail today on, on like on these concepts. So net present value is one way of analyzing uh, the profitability of an investment. Okay. So it is basically the summation of all the future cash flows, summation of all the future cash flows. Okay. But those future cash flows they have to be discounted back to today's dollars, okay? Uh, you cannot just like say, okay, next year uh, from my this gas well, I'm going to make, you know, uh, $500,000. Year two, I'm going to make $200,000. Year three, I'm going to make $100,000. You can't just say, sum it up, say 500 plus 200 plus 100. You have to take those future cash flows, okay? and discount them back to today's dollar. Now, how do you discount them back? Well, before we go into that detail, let's talk about why is net present value important? Well, two things, time value of money and inflation, okay? Time value of money and inflation. Now, what is time value of money? Time value of money, it just says that people are impatient about their money, okay? Time value of money and inflation are not the same thing. They're two different concepts. So time value of money, people are impatient about their money. Inflation is a reduction in purchasing power over time. Okay. So for example, when we talk about time value of money, let's just say if I were to offer you a hundred bucks today versus a hundred bucks, uh, let's just say um, uh, five days or, or, or one year from now, which one would you take? 
Well, you want to take that five dollars, you want to take that a hundred bucks today, right? Because you're impatient about your money, right? That's time value of money. Okay. Inflation is the reduction of purchasing power over time. If you look at the, um, like, for example, the US dollar, okay, in, in, the, in the past 100 years, you know, the value of dollar has gone down over time due to inflation. And that's just, it's, 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 it's a function of, you know, a lot of different factors, which, which I don't want to get into, right? Like right now, it's beyond the scope of this, you know, uh, uh, like webinar. But just remember that inflation is just a reduction in purchasing power of your money. Um, and, and, and basically, that's what's, that's why MPV or net present value is important. The, the way to think about MPV is just think about you have 500 US dollars and 200 Chinese yen. Okay. Can you just add these two? Can you just say 500 plus 200 is 700? No. Well, first you have to either convert the US dollar to Chinese yen and then add them or convert the Chinese yen to US dollar and then add them. Right. So if you look at, if you cash flows at different dates, are like different currencies, okay? So if you take, if you have cash flow at year one for, 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 for 100 bucks, a year two for 200 bucks, for year three for 300 bucks, you know, these are different dates. So you have to first convert them, discount them back to today's dollar and then add them up. And we'll go over the equation, we'll go over the calculations in a minute, okay? So very important concept here. So here's the equation, so MPV, is a summation of cash flows. Um, and and it's, so it's basically the summation of cash flows divided by one plus I to power of T. Now, what is I? I is basically your discount rate. They call it your you know, um, cost of capital, the opportunity cost of capital. There are different names for I. You can call it interest rate, discount rate, um, cost of capital, opportunity cost of capital, some people call it hurdle rate, you know, and we'll talk about how exactly this I is calculated. Okay. We'll talk about exactly how I or discount rate is calculated. So summation of cash flows divided by one plus I to power of what? To power of T. Now T is time. Okay. T is time. If, if you're doing a monthly versus yearly cash flows, I'll show you in a minute what you can do with T. Um, so it's a pretty simple equation. So one of the important uh, assumptions that MPV makes is that all the positive cash flows from a project are reinvested back at I. And I is the cost of capital, right? So the best way to think about I is the cost of doing business. What is the cost of doing business? The cost of doing business is summarized in this term called I, okay? So when EMP companies run projects, run, for example, what is the MPV of this project? What is the MPV of this well? Uh, or what, what, what is the MPV of the set of wells? They look at you know, um, um, the, the, the summation of cash flows, future cash flows, divided by one plus I, which is your cost of doing business or cost of capital to the power of T, which is time. So it's a pretty simple equation. And you know, we can go over, um, uh, like an example here in a minute. So here's a, a very important concept to consider. From an economic perspective, and here's a source here from the uh, Society of Petroleum Engineering Evaluations uh, at the bottom. This is like a, like, a, like a few years old, but the concept is pretty similar. It's, it's, it's very, pretty much the same. So from an economic perspective, from an economic perspective, 80% of the value of a project is associated with the first eight years of production. With less than 50% of the EUR, which is the estimated ultimate recovery produced. The next 42 years of production delivers only 20% of the present value and just over 50% of the EUR. So think about that. What I'm basically saying here is your initial production period, let's just say first eight years in this case, okay? is extremely important because most of your present value comes from that. Because as you discount future dates back to today's dollar, the uh, power of, you know, um, uh, that, 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 that value becomes less and less, right? So, so it is very important to, to really uh, try to maximize your production performance. 
trying to maximize your gas rate, your oil rate, whatever you're producing, you know, NGLs, whatever you're producing from your well, try to maximize that production in the first eight years, first eight years, uh, or a lot of com- like companies trying to maximize in the first like, like five years, you know, but the goal is trying to maximize it because 80% of your value, majority, the majority of your value is created in the, in the, in the, like, like in those years. And if you look at a reserve life of a well, you know, it, it varies from, you know, basin to basin, but um, a lot of the reserve life, usually 30 years to 50 years. I've seen it as, as high as 65 years in some of these gas wells, you know, but what's important is most of your, most of your value is created in the first, you know, like eight years and beyond that, you know, uh, the, the present from an economic perspective, only 20% of present value is created, you know? Uh, so really there is an inherent difference between EUR and MPV, right? If you look at it from an economic perspective, you know, uh, you really want to maximize your MPV because that's really, at the end of the day, that's really what matters. You know, if you maximize your EUR and your MPV gets, gets lower, you're not creating value. You're not creating as much value for your shareholders, so, so it's very important to take that into consideration. As, 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 a, as an engineer, uh, a lot of the engineers get caught up in, oh, the EUR will, will be a little bit less. Well, what's really important is MPV here. And you got to take into account time value. Money. The reason that 80% of value is created in the first eight years is because of time value money. You want to get your money as fast as possible. You want to be able, because of, you know, uh, of, of course, the time value money inflation that we just discussed. So that's a very important concept to consider. Now, what is the rule of thumb for MPV? Accept projects that are positive, of course. Reject projects that are negative MPV, okay? When a project has a negative MPV, it just simply says that the project does not generate enough value to pay off its cost, which is the cost of capital that we'll discuss about, okay? Uh, so I want to give you an example. Would you pick a project if, 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 if you invested $2 billion into a project, okay, and the MPV of that project was $2 million, would you accept that project? Well, in theory, you know, it says accept any project that is, you know, um, um, a positive MPV. But you got to remember, uh, when you invest $2 billion and you get $2 million out of a project, you know, you, uh, assuming that you're not taking any in, into account any of those risks, you know, um, you've got problems. You've got big problems because you don't want to invest into a project, uh, invest in, in two billion dollar in, into into a project, and uh, rely on the two million dollar return on the MPV. Uh, but remember that let's just say in 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 drilling operations and completions operations, there are always issues. What if you know something happens? What if you know, your casing fails? What if, you know, your bid got stuck? What if you have some operational issues, you know, then that MPV margin, which was $2 million would easily vanish and, and, and basically uh, become negative. So it's very important to just not look at just, 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 just a theory. Also think about it rationally. I'm investing so much money and what is my return on my investment? So that's the way I would look at it. Um, uh, so that's that's why it's very important because you want to take into account some kind of risks. So you want to almost have different scenarios. You know, what I always recommend is run sensitivity analysis. Sensitivity analysis is a different commodity pricing, a different gas pricing, different oil pricing. You know, uh, what happens if my gas price drops to two dollars per MCF? What happens if my oil price that is like currently sitting at 60 or 62 dollars a barrel drops to 25 dollars a barrel? What happens in those cases? Evaluate, do a full sensitivity analysis and pick projects that give you the highest return. Um, that's, that's called capital budgeting. You want to you, you assign, you want to do a, a full uh, throttle capital budgeting to pick your best projects. Let's do an example. Let's do an example and go over the MPV. So year zero, um, that's when you make your investment. You invest $100 million. That's why it's negative 100. Okay, year one, um, your cash flow or your profit. And you remember, cash flow is simply uh, profit. Is, is, is um, uh, cash flow and profit is the same. It's just revenue minus cost. Okay, so a year one, your profit is twenty million. 
Year two, your profit is 30 million. Year three, your profit is 40, 80, and 60. Now let's do, let's calculate the MPV. Well, MPV, if you remember, the summation of cash flows divided by one plus I to the power of T. In this case, for simplicity, I said, let's assume I is 10%, 10%. And that's why you see 0.1 here. So you take minus 100. When you take minus 100 divided by one plus 10% to the power of zero, that's why you're left with minus 100 here. So minus 100, 20 divided by one plus 10% to power of one, 30 divided by one plus 10% to power of two, 40 divided by one plus 10% to power of three, 80 divided by one plus 10% to power of four. And finally, at year five, $60 million divided by one plus 10% to power of five. You sum it up, you get $64.92 million. Not bad. You invested $100 million. And after five years, you're getting back 65, about $65 million. Not bad. So this, the calculation is pretty simple. Now you might say, Haas, this is yearly. What if I want to do monthly discounting? Well, in, in monthly discounting, you just take it, in, in, like instead of one, it'd be one divided by 12, two divided by 12, three divided by 12, four divided by 12, five divided by 12. That's how you do monthly discounting. And a lot of these commercial packages, uh, you know, you, 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 do, like you do your discounting on a monthly basis. You know, this is just an example to show uh, how the MPV works, okay? So you can just simply add up, say, okay, you know, 60, you know, plus 80, 140, plus 40, 180, plus 30, 210, plus 20, 230, you know, uh, minus 100 is 130. You can't just say my, my, my MPV is just a summation of these. You have to discount each one, 20 to today's dollar, $30 million to today's dollar, $40 million to today's dollar, 80 to, 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 to today's dollar, and 60 to, to today's dollar, and then sum it up. So you discount all the future cash flows to today's dollar, then you sum them up, okay? I hope it's crystal clear at this point. So now let's go and talk about you win a lottery. Let's just say you got your lucky day today and you won a million dollar lottery. Now don't get too excited yet. You'll actually get paid $50,000 per year for the next 20 years. If the discount rate is a constant 8% and the first payment will be year one, how much have you actually won in present dollar? When you win a million dollar lottery, when they say this guy won a $500 million lottery, as a matter of fact, they, they discount it back to today's dollar. That $500 million is actually going to be way less. And also you got to pay taxes on it. So, so, uh, uh, so the, those lottery guys give you the option. You can take a lump sum or yearly payments for the next 20 years. So let's, let's use the NPV equation to calculate what that lump sum would be if you won a million dollar lottery, okay? Assuming an 8% interest rate or discount rate. So if you look at this here, at year one, you have $50,000, year two, $50,000, all the way to year 20, $50,000. If you sum up all of these guys, you're looking at $1 million. Now let's uh, discount the $50,000 back to today. You know, like after year one, you can see here is $46,000. Discount $50,000 in year two, that's $42,000. You can see how the, um, the present value goes down in further out years. So in year 20, your present value is now only $10,727 versus, you know, the present value at year one is $46,000, pretty close to $50,000, you know. So now what you actually get paid, assuming an 8%, so I assume that I, I, I use an 8% discount rate, an 8% discount rate, you're actually getting paid $490,000. And then you also apply tax. This is not even apply taxes yet. You also apply taxes. I, I don't know what the tax rate is for these like lo lottery tickets, but you also apply taxes. So you're probably going to get maybe three fifty or, or, or some uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollars or so. You know, depending on the tax rate. 
you know, you want a million dollar, but you're not a millionaire. You actually have to discount it back if you want a lump sum and then um, uh, apply taxes on it. And that's how much you get paid. So at this point, I hope MPV makes sense. It just simply means you cannot take future, you know, uh, cash flows or future um, um, profits and just sum, it, sum, them up, uh, sum them up. You know, future cash flows at different dates are like different currencies, like I talked about. Uh, so you have to first discount them back. Then after discounting them back, um, you know, you sum them up and that will give you your NPV, your net present value. So now we talked about what net present value is. Let's talk, talk about what I is, I. I is basically, as I said, it's called a discount rate. It's called cost of doing business. It's called cost of capital. It's called opportunity cost of capital. It's called hurdle rate. So I is simply, the best way I think about I is the cost of doing business, you know, uh, and that's very important to take into account. So what discount rate do I assume? A lot of these things, if you look at, for example, a lot of these uh, investor presentations or, um, you know, um, if you look at a lot of these, you know, uh, presentations, slides, they always assume a 10% discount rate or usually a 10% discount rate, which is not bad. It's a pretty good assumption, you know, but the discount rate um, for every company is different. Okay. Company X does not have the same discount rate as company Y because that depends on how, their equity, their debt ratio, which we'll discuss in a minute. So how can I calculate the discount rate? How can I calculate the discount rate for my company? Let's just say company X. Well, there's, you can use the weighted average cost of capital, weighted average cost of capital, W-A-C-C, -C. they call it WAC. What is my WAC? What is my weighted average cost of capital? That's how you do, that, that's how you calculate your discount rate. So in the next few slides, I wanna talk about how you can calculate your weighted average cost of capital. Okay, so let's, let's go over that. So you need money, you need money, what are you gonna do? Well, there are different options. You can raise money through debt, you can go to the bank, Let's just say you want to buy a car, okay? And you don't have money. What do you do? You can go to the bank and say, hey, I want to buy this car. You know, can you loan me this much money? They look at your credit history. They look at, you know, how much down payment you're going to put in. They look at different factors. They look at how, how long you've had a job and, and so on and so forth, you know? And based on that, you can borrow money from the, from the bank to buy your car or to buy your house or whatever you want to do, okay? So that's, that's debt, same thing with, 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 with corporations, you know, they can get money through bonds. They can issue bonds or they can just uh, get money from the bank and, and basically use that money to invest in, 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 in projects. So that's one, debt. And the other type of uh, way to raise money is, is equity, is, is common stock, is common and preferred stock. Um, and, and those common and preferred stocks are both referred to as equity, are both referred to as equity. Uh, so, so, so two ways to raise money, debt and equity, debt and equity. Now, how do we calculate the weighted average cost of capital? Okay. So weighted average cost of capital, the first time you look at the equation, you're like, oh my God, this is pretty, pretty complex, but it's actually not. I'm going to go over through each one. Just remember that weighted average cost of capital has two things. One side of it is, is, is debt. Okay. And the other side of it is equity, which includes common stock and preferred stock. For simplicity, let's just say, you know, we're going to focus on just the common stock because a lot of uh, corporations don't often don't offer preferred stocks. OK, so let's just say, you know, uh, your weighted average cost of capital is basically your WD, which is your weight of debt, which is essentially percentage of the company that is debt. OK, then your R of D which is cost of debt, okay, cost of debt. And then they multiply that by, by, by one minus your tax rate, your corporation tax rate. Why is that? Because debt is tax deductible, at least in like in the United States, debt is tax deductible. So when, when, when companies, you know, uh, incur debt, they can deduct those debts on their taxes. And that's why this weighted average cost of capital equation takes into account weight of debt times cost of debt 
times one minus t, which is your corporate tax rate, okay, corporate tax rate. And then plus is gonna be your weight of equity, you know, let's just call it, let's just call it the WP and WC uh, as the weight of equity, okay? Uh, it's just because, because preferred stock and common stock are considered part of equity. So we just call it weight of equity, okay? Times RP and RC, those are weight of, those are cost of equity cost of equity okay um so so just remember debt and equity weight of debt times cost of debt times one minus tax rate plus weight of equity times cost of equity weight of equity times cost of equity now that we understand what the equation is let's go over each one so how do i calculate cost of equity well cost of equity comes from a model called capital asset pricing model which I'll talk about in a minute, capital asset pricing model. Cost of debt is just the, simply a weighted average of the percentage interest rate that you have. So let's just say you have, you have a car, you have a house and you have a boat, okay? Your car interest rate is 3% uh, and, and you bought that car for $50,000. Your house interest is uh, 4% and you bought that house for $500,000, okay? And then your boat interest is, let's just say, 5%. And you bought that house or, or you bought that boat for uh, $60,000, okay? You just take the weighted average of all those interest rates. You know, the, I think I said 4%, 5%, and 6% or whatever I said. You know, those, you just take the weighted average of those interest rates, you know, and that would give you your cost of, your cost of debt. So it's just simply the weighted average of those interest rates. So the same thing with corporations. They have you know, different types of debts and different types of bonds, and each one has different interest rates. You just take the weighted average of those interest rates to come up with your cost of debt. It is your cost of debt. Now, your weight of debt is just simply percentage of the company that is financed by debt, okay? And then your weight of equity is simply the percentage of the company that is equity, that is equity, okay? And we'll do an example here in a minute. So the, like the most important one that is a little more complex is the uh, capital asset pricing model to calculate your cost of equity, cost of equity. Let's do an example. So your weight of debt and equity for of any company can be easily calculated using their debt to equity ratio that is publicly available. Okay, let's just say company X's debt to equity ratio is 0.62. So you just take the weight of debt and equity can be therefore calculated by 0.62 divided by 0.62 plus one, 38% is weight of debt. And then uh, what, whatever the remaining balance is, the remaining percentage is one minus 38% is 0.62, 62% is uh, basically the weight of equity. So you can easily calculate a company's uh, weight of debt and weight of equity using their debt to equity ratio uh, that is publicly available, of course, for public companies. If you're not public, if you're a private company, that information is not available. Uh, so it's pretty simple calculation, just simple algebra. Uh, you take uh, 0.62 divided by 0.62 plus one, you get 38%. And then whatever the remaining percentages, that is your weight of equity. So now let's just say a bond is issued, okay? After two years, you'll pay back $1,000 to the investors. What is the cost of debt for this particular bond? Assume 40% corporation tax rate. Again, this, the, the corporate tax rate uh, was reduced down from 39%, I think down to uh, 21%, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when Trump became president. Uh, so. Uh, the, 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 this is just this is just for just this is just an example for this for the, for the slide deck, you know. Uh, but but you know the, these these corporate taxes are actually much lower unless they change. So I mean, it depends on who's who's in charge and who changes those those those, those tax rates, you know. So, anyways, going back to this, so your par value, which which is uh, the value at which the bond was issued, was nine fifty. Uh, uh, at maturity, you're going to pay back the investors a thousand dollars. Okay. The maturity value is a thousand dollars. So you can use your uh, equation here. You have present value, you know, which is, if you remember, it was the MPV is equal to 
future value, if you remember, this was a summation of cash flows, but in this case, you're just doing it for one. It's going to be future value divided by one plus I to power of N. So let's just uh, replace present value with 950. Your par value with 950 is equal. Your future value is going to be $1,000. So the question is, what is the cost of debt? Which is what is your I in this case? Um, and that would be you solve for I, and then I would be 2.59%. Your cost of debt would be 2.59 minus 1 point, uh, minus 40% uh, corporate tax rate, which was given here. So minus 40% uh, tax rate, you're left with 1.56. That is your cost of debt. So I hope I'm clear so far. So far, we've calculated, you know, weight of debt and weight of, uh, weight of equity, which you can uh, easily obtain from debt to equity ratio. We've talked about uh, cost of debt. Okay, cost of debt. And then the next thing we're going to talk about, talk about cost of equity. I just want to point out one thing, you know, let's look at this chart here. This chart again is, is obtained from this um, Society of Petroleum Engineering Evaluations uh, site. Here's the source at the bottom. Uh, you can see here uh, the debt to market cap on the Y axis. Okay. And then the company name on the, on the X axis. This is a little bit old. This is probably like a few years old, but the concept is still similar, you know, so who would you want to invest in? Who would you have the most confidence in? Do you have a lot of confidence in companies that have a lot of debt or, um, or companies that have more liquidity? Um, and that's the question to ask, whether you're a professional investor, whether you are uh, work for any company, you really want to understand their balance sheet. You want to understand where they come from. You understand how much liquidity they have, how much debt they have, because you want to be able to predict your next five moves. You want to be able to predict what am I going to do? If this company is going to go bankrupt, do I want to just stay with them or not? You know, so you really want to evaluate them, especially if, 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 if they're a public company to make sure that they're going to be in business, you know, uh, for a long time, you want to invest in companies or you want to be with companies uh, that you have potential growth for a long period of time. So looking at this chart, you know, when you look at some of these companies here that have higher debt, I'd be very cautious, you know, I'd be very cautious. For example, Chesapeake was one of them and they filed for bankruptcy just, um, what is it? Um, I think a few months ago, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but you have more stable companies on this side, you know, like Exxon and Occidental and, and like, like in those guys. Again, this, is, this, this, this chart is a few years old but I'm just trying to show you the concept. This is not about pointing companies here. This is just trying to show you the concept. Uh, so, so it's very important to understand um, uh, companies debt. And I'll give you a simple example. If you guys remember, you guys are probably too young since you guys are students, but if, if you um, remember uh, 2008 market crash, you know, in 2008 with a market crash, Lehman Brothers, Lehman Brothers was one of the major financial institutions in the United States. And in 2007, I think their revenue was, was billions of dollars. In 2008, they were gone. They were bankrupt. They were history. Well, what happened? There's actually been a lot of study, a lot of studies on Lehman Brothers. And when you look at them, uh, they had a very high leverage ratio. They had a lot of debt. They had a lot of debt. So it is very important to really understand debt. Debt is, is good to, to, to some extent, is good to use to your advantage. Some, some, some leverage is good in business, you know, because you want to be able to scale. You want to be able to uh, take your business to the next level. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying debt is bad. You've got to have some debt, you know, and also debt is tax deductible, which is another advantage of having debt, you know. Uh, but at the same time, you don't want to have too much debt and just keep borrowing and borrowing, not having, not creating cash flow. And then if you have too much debt, you just become, you could become history overnight and you could, you could go bankrupt. So it is very important to pay attention to debt. That's, that's all I'm trying to say here. So we talked about, you know, the weight of debt, the, the weight of equity. Uh, and then we talked about the, um, uh, the cost of debt. We haven't talked about cost of equity. If you remember a few slides ago, I said cost of equity can be calculated using as uh, using a, a model called capital asset pricing model. 
capital asset pricing model. And it is, it's actually widely known as CAPM, CAPM, okay? So capital asset pricing model. Now there are two ideas, that, 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 like the general idea behind a, a, a capital asset pricing model is that investors gotta be compensated in two different ways. One, time value of money, okay? Time value of money. Um, and then two, is risk, the amount of compensation for taking additional risk. For example, let's just say, you know, you're an investor, okay? Somebody comes to you and say, hey, invest in my company. In your mind, you're thinking, okay, first off, I wanna be compensated for time value of money, which is usually the risk-free rate, which is what the US treasury bonds and those guys offer, which is pretty small interest rate, right? It's like, like right now is less than 2%, for a 30 year treasury bond, okay? Um, so, so, so investors are thinking, I wanna be compensated for two things. One, a risk-free rate, which a lot of these, you know, bonds and all, like all these very secure, uh, like treasury bonds offer me. And on top of that, I also wanna be compensated for taking additional risk uh, for investing in your company, okay? Two things, risk and time value of money. And it makes sense. You know, if I'm, if, if I'm asked, if I have a company, and I ask you, Hey, Mr. So-and-so or Mrs. So-and-so, please invest in my company. Well, you're th as an investor, you got to think, well, I got to take into account time and value money. I got to take into account risk. Now this cap M model is summarized into this equation here, which is called RF, which is your risk-free rate, which I'll is basically your risk-free rate is basically your U.S. Treasury bond that you can use for this equation. Your beta, which we'll talk about here in a minute, okay? And then this risk premium, RM minus RF, which is your risk premium or it's, it's also your inflation rate, okay? Your, your, your RM is your market rate and your RF is your risk-free rate. And this combination RM minus RF is called risk premium or inflation rate. Okay, so this is this is called the capital. This equation here is what people call um, a capital asset pricing model. Okay, and remember, we're trying to calculate the cost of equity. Cost of equity. So now let's talk about what is a risk-free rate. So risk-free rate is basically you can use the U.S. Treasury bond risk-free rate, which you can you know you can just type it in online and you can see the table how much U.S. Treasury bond offers you after one year, after five years, after 10 years, after 20, 30, or whatever you're interested in, okay? You can you usually use a 30-year like U.S. Treasury bond for that. And then your average, your RM is your average market return. Usually when people calculate their, um, their, their, their uh, weighted average cost of capital, they use an average market return of S&P 500. Okay, S and P five hundred. Then what is beta? The only thing that is left now is is beta. So beta is basically uh, how sensitive the stock is to fluctuations in the market. So an example, if if a market return is ten percent, a stock whose beta is one point five would return fifteen percent, fifteen percent, because it would go up one point five times as the market, one and a half times your your ten percent. That's 15%, uh, which gives you a beta of 1.5. So that's what beta is. It basically is, beta basically says how sensitive the stock is to fluctuations in the market. How sensitive the stock is to fluctuations in the market. Okay, so not bad. The equation is not bad. So, you know, you got your risk-free rate, which is your U.S. Treasury bond. You got your beta, which we talked about what, what that was. And then you have your risk premium, which is your market rate, your S&P 500 market rate, average market return minus your uh, risk-free rate. And then you're done. You can calculate your capital asset pricing model. Now, one thing that I want to point out is systematic risk versus idiosyncratic risk, okay? It's actually a very important concept. If you take any uh, of the uh, finance classes or if you do your, your MBA one day, so you, they usually teach these systematic and idiosyncratic risk, okay? So systematic risk are things that are on, on a broader level. Those are systematic risk on a broader level, such as 
uh, uh, risk associated with fluctuations in interest rates. You know, these are broader level risk, okay? But idiosyncratic risk uh, are things that are uh, specific, more specific to a company or to a, uh, to a, um, to an industry. Um, so for example, I'll give you a simple example. Um, um, when, when interest rate changes, you know, or fluctuates, these are systematic risks, which are taken into account in your beta, which is your B here. Right. But, um, when, when, for example, Steve jobs was the, the, the uh, uh, was with Apple, was a CEO of Apple, and then he became very sick, right? And then he passed away after uh, uh, he, he basically had to resign from his position or had to step down as from, from his position because of illness uh, from Apple. You know, when Steve Jobs, uh, you know, um, uh, stepped down uh, when he was at Apple, uh, those are called idiosyncratic risks. Those are things that are associated with a specific stock. Um, and, and basically when Steve Jobs uh, stepped down, like at first, you know, um, their, their stock price went down. And then over time, uh, when, 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 when people were more confident about Apple and how, how they'd, be, like they'd be able to, to deliver, you know, uh, the stock price of, of, of Apple has done quite well, like very well with, with uh, Tim Cook taking over. And, and, and they're actually doing pretty well. So uh, the idiosyncratic risk is not uh, considered or is not taken into account in beta, but systematic risk is, okay? So just understand that systematic risk uh, is different from idiosyncratic risk. Systematic risk is on a broader level, you know, such as fluctuations in interest rate in the market, you know, uh, those are considered when you, can, when, you, when, you, when, when, when you look at the beta of a company, but idiosyncratic risk is not considered, is not considered. An example of idiosyncratic risk was just the Steve Job example that I just gave you. Another example could be Elon Musk, you know, Elon Musk is considered a visionary, you know, he's got great ideas. Uh, he's, he's accomplished so much. And, and, and basically, I, I personally have a lot of respect for, 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 for Elon Musk, you know, so if, for, for, like, for example, Tesla's uh, stock, if you look at Tesla's stock, you know, of, of course, a portion of Tesla's, Tesla stock uh, takes into account um, how 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 um, uh, the vision of Elon Musk, uh, what 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 he's going to do in the next next five or ten years, you know. So the beta, uh, you, you know. So 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 if some, something God forbid, like something happens to Elon Musk, you know, that uh, could have could really have a significant impact on 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 Tesla's stock, you know, in the short term, of course, you know. And then of course, if some somebody else can come in. And, and, and really f like fill that gap uh, to, to, like, to as much as possible and take the company to the next level, that would be different. Um, so so it, is, it is very important to understand systematic risk and idiosyncratic risk, you know, when you invest in a company. So now let's talk about, let's, let's go over a, a weighted average uh, cost of capital calculation. Let's just say a company wants to raise money, okay? A company will sell 50 million shares of common stock with an expected return of 15%. And in addition, the company will issue a $10 million of debt with a cost of debt of 12%. Assuming a corporate tax rate of 35%, calculate weighted average cost of capital. Remember from this, this lecture, we talked about you know, weighted average cost of capital is the same as discount rate, same as cost of capital, same as cost of doing business, you know, but for this stuff, we're just using the term weighted average cost of capital or WAC. So first, let's calculate the total value of the company. So first off, the company will sell 15 million shares of common stock. So 15 plus um, uh, will also issue $10 million of debt. So 15 plus 10, that's $25 million. Okay, that's the total value of the company. Then the weight of equity is going to be uh, 15 uh, million divided by 25. Uh, and then the weight of debt is going to be 10 million, which is given right here, 10 million of debt divided by 25. So you got 60% is, is, is equity and then 40% is debt. And then your weighted average cost of capital would be, um, weight of debt, which is 40% times your, uh, cost of debt, 
which is given as cost of debt of 12% right here, times one minus your corporation tax rate, which is 35% given to you, plus your weight of equity, which is 60%, times your cost of equity, which is again given to you as um, the common stock would expect a return of 15% as 15%. Then you do the math, you get a weighted average cost of capital of 12.12%. So 12.12%. And by the way, this, 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 your, your, your weighted average cost of capital changes. As you can see, it's a function of your debt. It's a function of your equity. It's a function of your corporate tax rate. You know, but the idea here is to generate value beyond your weighted average cost of capital. Let's just say if, if, if your cost of capital is 12% in this case, you want to, your return want to be higher than that. Let's just say you want to be 20%, 25%, because the value that you create for the shareholders is the difference between your IRR and your um, weighted average cost of capital. And this takes us to the next concept, which is called internal rate of return, okay, your IRR. So what is IRR? So IRR is basically, I'm, I'm going to show you like an, like an example in a minute, and I think that will clarify it much better. But IRR is, is referred to as internal rate, uh, rate of return, and is the discount rate when MPV of a particular, of particular cash flows is zero, okay? So the higher the IRR, the more growth potential a project has, okay? IRR is used for project evaluation and profitability for project. The formula for calculating IRR is basically the same as same formula as MPV, except that the MPV is replaced by zero. The MPV is replaced by zero. And I'll show you here, here's the equation. So you can see here, this is the same equation for MPV, except MPV is now replaced with zero. And then, um, in a set of discount rate here, I'm using IRR, IRR. Now, one of the flaws I would say with IRR, if you recall, I said MPV um, assumes that all the future cash flows are reinvested back at discount rate, right? But in IRR, all the future cash flows are reinvested back at IRR instead of discount rate or cost of capital. Okay, so you can see here you have summation of cash flows divided by one plus IRR. So all of your future cash flows are reinvested back at IRR, which is one of the um, flaws with using the IRR technique. So MPV, a lot of companies use IRR, a lot of companies report an IRR. But in my mind, MPV is, is, is more powerful because it truly gives you a sense of um, how much value you can create from that project. Now, you can look at both. You, know, you don't have to just look at you know, IRR or just, 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 just MPV, but just understand the flaws and inherent problems with some of these uh, capital budgeting metrics that we've discussed so far. So going to do an example here. Just say year zero, you've um, um, invested $500 million. Year one, you're still at negative cash flow. You're negative 100. Year two, uh, your cash flow becomes 20 million. Year three, your cash flow becomes 300 million. Year four becomes 400. And year five, your cash flow became $500 million. Now, how do I calculate IRR? So here's my equation. Zero is equal to summation of cash flows. Uh, and then cash flow divided by one plus your IRR to power of T. So what I do here is I take minus one, 500 divided by one plus IRR to power of zero. Of course, you're left with minus 500. And then minus 100 divided by one plus IRR to power of one, 20 divided by one plus IRR to power of two, 300 divided by one plus IRR to power of three, 400 divided by one plus IRR to power of four, and then 500 
divided by one plus IRR to the power of five. Now, how do I calculate IRR here? Well, you have to, you know, I mean, if, if you're not using um, Excel, you know, you have to plug in a number here uh, that would result in this whole equation, this whole expression here uh, to be zero. Okay, so if you plug in 19.89% in Leo of IRR in the de de uh, de denominator of every expression, uh, your answer is going to equal to zero. And that's how you calculate your IRR. You can actually use Excel. In Excel, you have an IRR function. You can, you can do that pretty easily. In commercial packages, the way they do it is they do a linear interpolation. They calculate, you know, the... Um, uh, the, the, the MPV at, at different discount rates. And then when your MPV uh, goes from positive to negative, that's when they do a li linear interpolation and calculate your IRR. Uh, so there are different techniques to calculate your IRR, but I'm just showing you like, here's how you do it on paper. You know, it's just um, same equation as MPV, except you replace it with zero. And then you put IRR in instead of discount rate or in instead of, you know, your, your cost of capital. Remember guys, when I say discount rate, it's the same as cost of capital, is the same as weighted average cost of capital, which we discussed how you calculate. Uh, these are all the same terminologies. It's the same as cost of doing business. Basically the best way to think about your discount rate is just, is that it is cost of doing business. It's the cost of doing business. So now this is very important. If IRR is greater than weighted average cost of capital, right? The project's rate of return will exceed its cost. And as a result, the project should be accepted. If IRR is less than weighted average cost of capital, the project rate of return will not exceed its cost. And as a result, the project should be rejected. So in other words, let's just say, go back to this example here. The weighted average cost of capital that we calculated was 12.12%. If your IRR, if you calculate your IRR for, 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 for a project and your IRR came at 8%, okay, it doesn't mean your return is 8%. Actually, you're losing money because uh, the difference, because your cost of doing business is 12%, but your IRR is just 8%. You know, so don't be confused with, the internal rate of return of 8% means I'm gonna get 8% back. No, actually IRR, if your IRR is 8%, it depends on what your cost of capital is. If your cost of capital or your weighted average cost of capital is 12%, that means you're losing 4%, right? But if you calculate your IRR and your IRR was 20%, it doesn't mean you're making 20%. It just means you're making 20% minus 12% you're making only 8%, okay? So that's why I said in that slide that your IRR has to be greater than your weighted average cost of capital. If your IRR is the same as your weighted average cost of capital, what does that mean? It means your NPV is zero, okay? So if your IRR in this case, if you calculate your, your IRR for this project and it turned out to be 12.12% exactly, the MPV for that project is zero, zero. So when IRR is equal to your weighted average cost of capital, your MPV is going to be zero. So you have to be, you have to be above weighted average cost of capital for MPV to be positive. If you're below it, your MPV will be negative. If it's equal, your MPV will be zero. So just remember that, very important. So when people say my IRR is 20%, it depends on what their cost of capital is. If their cost of capital is only 5%, that's not bad. 20% minus 5%, that's 15% return. That's not bad at all. But if, the, if, if, if their cost of capital is 18% and their um, um, their IRR is 20%, that incremental is only 2%, you know? So, and as you saw today, I think you guys understand now how weighted average cost of capital is impacted and how it's, it, it is, it is, it is affected is based on debt and equity. Now, of course, tax rate. So let's go talk about IRR. 
So MPV assumes usually is, is superior to ROR for two main reasons. Because MPV assumes that positive cash flows are reinvested at the cost of capital, while IRR assumes, unrealistically assumes that positive cash flows are reinvested back at IRR. Okay. Now, another issue with IRR is that IRR can have more than one solution. If cash flows experience a sign change by being positive in one year and changing to negative in, in the next year, the IRR method will have more than one solution. If this occurs, the IRR method must not be used for project evaluation, must not be used for project evaluation. By the way, all these material, this is just one section in the book that we published, Hydraulic Fracturing on Conventional Reservoirs in the second edition. Uh, we've talked, we've, we've gone through step-by-step -step calculations on you know, in, in, including a decline curve analysis and running economic analysis using monthly cash flows step by step. And we've gone through that. In this lecture, I have one hour or one and a half hour to go over, you know, just uh, the, like the main basic stuff. But we have a lot more details if you guys get a chance to get your hands on the book and, and really, really study it. So let's talk about uh, conflicts between project A and project B. So let's just say you have um, uh, interest rate of zero, five, ten percent, all the way to thirty-five, like uh, all the way to like 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 thirty percent. Then you have MPV of project A, MPV of project B. So um, as you can see here, as you increase your interest rate, or your weighted average cost of capital, or your discount rate, you know, um, your your MPV is going to keep going down, right? MPV is zero percent, is sixty. Um, MPV at um, five percent interest rate is forty-three. As you increase it, it's going to go down, and eventually you're going to go from positive MPV to negative MPV. Now, the way a lot of these commercial software calculates your IRR is they do a linear interpolation. They take five; it went from positive five to negative four. It was at twenty-five uh, at twenty percent. It went to twenty-five percent. What is the linear interpolation between 20 and 25 to get you that? You can do the math. And that's how you calculate your IRR for project A. For project B, as I said, you can you also go from positive 50, 39, 30, 22. At some point, you went from positive to negative. And if you do a linear interpolation between 6 and negative 2, 25 and 30%, you can get the exact IRR of project B. Let's plot this. Let's plot this in this figure. This is actually what we have in like in the book as well. So you have a discount rate of zero to uh, thirty percent, as you saw, zero to thirty percent. And I'm just simply plotting at zero percent. Your project A is sixty. Your project B is fifty. At zero percent, your project A is fifty. I'm sorry, your project A is 60, your project B is 50. If you plot the rest of the points, you get something like this. If you look at this plot here, one thing that is important to notice is that there's a crossover point. That crossover point um, goes from here, uh, is, is about 8.9%. If you look at this crossover point between these two lines, it's about 8.9%. So the question that you might ask, Haas, which project do I pick? Do I pick project A or do I pick project B? Well, my answer to you is going to be, it is a function of um, your discount rate. Okay. In this case, if you look at before this crossover point, 8.9%, your project A has a higher MPV, okay, than project B, but project B has a higher IRR than project A, okay? But after the crossover point, your project B has both higher MPV and higher IRR. So to, to answer your question, which project would you pick? I would say it depends on your cost of capital. If you told me your cost of capital was 5%, 5%, I would say pick the project with higher MPV which is project A, okay? 
But if you told me your cost of capital was 15%, 15%, I will tell you pick project B, pick project B. Because when your cost of capital is high, delaying cash flows will penalize you. It's a very important statement. When cost of capital is high, delaying cash flows will penalize you. And that's why it's, it's, a, it's an important dynamic. It's important to understand what your cost of capital is. And if you plot these two projects, project A and project B, you know, which one would I pick? Because there's a conflicting story here. One has a higher MPV, but it has a lower IRR before this crossover point. And another one has higher MPV and higher RR after this crossover point. So if your cost of capital is 5%, choose project A. If your cost of capital is 15%, choose project B. Because delaying cash flows will penalize you when your cost of capital is high. I hope I'm loud and clear in this example. So as I said, the internal rate of return is, you know, says deflect, defectively assumes that positive cash flows from a pr particular project are reinvested at IRR, okay? So to account for that flaw, um, modified IRR or modified internal rate of return was developed, okay? Now, MIRR or modified internal rate of return assumes that cash flows from a project are reinvested at cost of capital or a particular reinvestment rate, okay? So that's, that's the, that, so it tries to actually take that into account. If you look at the equation, um, uh, you, you have the future value of positive cash flows at reinvestment rate, and then your present value and negative cash flows at cost of capital or finance rate minus one. Here's the equation. And here's an example. Let's go over an example that would make sense. So calculate the MIRR at cost of capital of 10% uh, and reinvestment rate of 12%. Remember in MIRR, you have to have two rates, your cost of capital, and also what is your reinvestment rate that you want this project to be reinvested at? So you have to provide two things. If you, if you do MIRR function in Excel, it would give you the same thing. So you have to provide your, your, your um, cost of capital, your discount rate, and also the reinvestment rate that, you, that, you, that you'd like to apply. Here's project A, and here's project B. First, you calculate the future value of project A. It would simply be a, like 100, 250, 320, 385, 400. It'd be 100. 250, 320, 385, 400. Then times one plus reinvestment rate of 12%, which was given to power of four, and then to power of three, to power of two, to power of one, then to power of zero. And that would give you the future value of project A. Do the same thing for future value of project B. And then the equation is simply 1741.15 divided by minus, this minus was in the equation, and then minus 600, which came from this guy here, minus 600, this is your investment uh, amount, then minus 350, minus 350. And then you're doing this over five years, so your N would be five, your five, and then you solve for this. Your MIRR is 24% for project A and 39% for project B. So you can, if, if, if your manager says, you know, I want to make a more reasonable assumption, um, ask for what reinvestment rate would you like to choose and use modified internal rate of return as opposed to IRR, your internal rate of return. Finally, I have a couple more you know, just screening tools that I want that I want you to know. Payback period. Payback period is pretty simple. It's another capital budgeting method to determine quick profitability of an like or, of an original investment. It's just simply your initial investment divided by cash flow, cash inflow per period. 
let's do an example here. So let's just say you have zero, you have year zero, you invested 100 million, year one, you got 20 million back, year two, you got 30 million back, 40, 45, and 70. So since you invested 100 million, this basically says how long would it take me to get my initial investment back? So you got 20 plus 30, that's 50, plus uh, 40, that's 90, right? So you're gonna get your investment back between year three and four, right? You, you do a simple math here, three plus, uh, you know, you have 10 divided by 45, that'll give you 3.22 years. So in 3.22 years, you get your investment back. But one of the flaws with this technique is that it's easy to, well, well it's, it, it doesn't take into account time value of money. I just said, I just added, I, I just added these up. I said 20 plus 30, is 50 plus 40 is 90. And then uh, between year three and four, which was 3.22, I got my initial investment of $100 million back. So this method does not or ignores time value of money, which is not good. And this method also ignores cash flows that occurs after the payback period. So after payback period of 3.22, it's ignoring what happens afterward which is also a flaw of this, tech, of, of, of this method. But the strength of payback period is that it's easy to calculate, super easy. It provides an intuition of a project risk and liquidity. You know, this is just, again, nobody makes project, nobody makes, you know, um, um, important decisions based on just looking at payback period, you know, payback like method. Uh, they look at, different, all kinds of metrics, MPV, IRR, payback, discounted payback, MIRR. Yeah, you have to take everything into account and look at the uh, financials of your company to make those decisions. Now, to, uh, take, to take care of the uh, time value of money issue, uh, you can also use a discounted payback period, a discounted payback period. So let's do an example here. Let's just say you have at year zero, you invested 90 million. Year one, you invested 20 million. Year two, you, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, like at, at year zero, you invested 90 million. At year one, your, your return or your profit or your cash flow was 20 million. Year two, your cash flow was 30 million and so on and so forth. First, what you got to do is let's just assume a 10% discount rate. You first, you calculate the present value of each one. So the present value of minus 90 is going to be minus 90 at year zero. The present value of 20, 20 divided by one plus, you know, 10% to power of one, 30 divided by one plus 10% to power of two, 40 divided by one plus 10% to power of three. Do the same thing all the way to here. And then this is your answer. So 20 divided by one plus 10% uh, to power of one gives you 18.18. 18. Uh, 30 would become 24.79. 40 would become 30.05. This is the present value of your cash flows. And then instead of using um, this column here, which was just not taking into account um, the, um, um, you know, the uh, uh, pre like present value, in this case, you're actually taking into account the present value. So if you take 18 plus 24 plus 30, uh, you're looking at a pay discounted payback period between year three and four. If you do the math, it'd be around three and a half years, three and a half years. So that's how you can calculate your uh, discounted payback period as opposed to payback period. So, so uh, these are, again, there are, there are different types of um, um, uh, capital budgeting methodologies. I've covered the most important ones, the MPV, the IRR, the modified IRR, the payback and discounted payback period. So all the materials that were covered today came from this book here on hydraulic factory on conventional reservoirs, the economic analysis chapter, which goes into detail. I think it has 50 or 60 pages on step-by-step -step economic analysis uh, performance and calculations. And then also this is the machine learning guide for oil and gas book that is coming up in less than a month uh, uh, by, by Alzevir, which has a lot of Python codes. In addition, uh, feel free to also subscribe to the Officer Intelligence YouTube channel um, um, where I invite various um, executives and, and professors and talk about the future of data science and automation 
uh, primarily in the oil and gas sector. Uh, feel free to follow and uh, me on LinkedIn if you have any questions. I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Engineer Hasbeliadi. It was a great session as usual. Um, you have explained everything in a clear way during the session, but still I have uh, a question from my half. Uh, what's your opinion of Monte Carlo simulator and crystal ball to determine the net present value and reserve uh, probability? Yeah, that's actually uh, pretty recommended. You can use Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, yeah, that's that's going to be part of your sensitivity analysis. So, um, so I, actually, I, I did have a slide, a slide on, on on Monte Carlo simulation here, but I just wanted I, I didn't want to go too much into detail because I had like limited time. But yeah, you can use Monte Carlo simulation to run different sensitivity analysis and to come up with to come up with um, um, a, a distribution. Uh, as opposed to just one value, you know, because calculating the MPV, for example, at a certain, uh, uh, you know, uh, price is not recommended because the price fluctuates so much, right? So what I always tell people is vary different things. For, like, for example, vary your operating costs, vary your, 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 your pricing, your, 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 your commodity pricing from, let's just say, if you're running, you know, an, for, 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 for natural gas wells, vary your natural gas uh, pricing from, you know, $2 per MMBTU or buck fifty per MMBTU to all the way to $3, $4 per MMBTU and show the distribution uh, of the P10, P50, and P90 as opposed to just showing uh, one value. So, so long story short, to answer your question, absolutely, you can use Monte Carlo simulation and uh, sensitize on... Uh, various parameters that uh, you have uncertainty about uh, to come up with a distribution as opposed to just one answer. Okay, uh, great. Uh, someone is asking, could you please recommend a book for the petroleum economics? Um, I don't have a book on top of my head right now, but if you just do a quick search on Google, um, you can find that, but on the book that we published, Hydraulic Fracturing on Conventional Reservoirs, we have chapter, I think, I'm trying to remember, chapter 18, I believe. Uh, we have, I think, over 50 or 60 pages of covering uh, like everything from scratch, from, from start to finish. So you might want to check that chapter out. I think it has plenty of information and examples for you to get a pretty good understanding of uh, the economic analysis in the oil and gas industry. Great. Um, that's all for today. Thank you, Eng Engineer Haas. It was a pleasure to have you during this internship. And thank you all. The session will be uploaded to PyoPetri YouTube channel. And don't forget to solve the, the quiz on Google Classroom. Best of luck and thank you. Thank you.